Hey guys, so another Splenda video. Uh, so recently, Dr. Michael Greger of nutritionfacts.org put out a video called Effect of uh, Sucralose Splenda on the Microbiome, and uh, given my defense of Splenda of Sucralose uh, in a past video, people have wanted me to do a response. Many people just wanting me to <laughs> admit that I was wrong, uh, because according to Greger's video, Splenda may lead to obesity and diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease. Sorry to disappoint, but my position has not changed since my original video. Not because I'm obsessed with Splenda. I actually consume a lot less than I did at the time of the original video, just because I'm not drinking coffee on a regular basis like I was. Uh, so not because I'm obsessed, but because I pay attention to the scientific consensus. Uh, just like I do when it comes to climate change and evolution and vaccines and genetic modification. And uh, since I put out that video, the scientific consensus on Splenda has not changed. It is still safe and it is still a hell of a lot better than sugar. And yes, it is still vegan. This has nothing to do with Gregor's video, but has to do with a video from Happy Healthy Vegan, uh, in which Ryan says that Splenda is not vegan because it was tested on animals in the past. Keyword past. Uh, as I mentioned in my original Splenda video, sucralose Splenda no longer tested on animals. Uh, the harm, quite literally, has already been done. Uh, using Splenda today is absolutely vegan. I also find it interesting that uh, Ryan, that Happy Healthy Vegan, has a video where he and Angie eat uh, the new non-dairy ice cream from Ben & Jerry's, and they try all four flavors, including the PB and cookies one that contains palm oil. So Ryan is against using a product that used to result in animal harm, but seems to have no qualms with using a product that currently results in animal harm, not to mention environmental and human harm. But you know what? Palm oil was never tested on animals, so I guess it's fine. So now on to the main claims made in Dr. Greyer's video, that consumption of sucralose may lead to alterations in gut microflora, insulin resistance, and IBD. Splenda and inflammatory bowel disease. I want to start with uh, Greyer's kind of big scary point made in the video, made later in the video, uh, that sucralose may cause inflammatory bowel disease, which includes Crohn's and celiac disease because it's rather silly and easily dismissed. This link is based on one author's hypothesis, and as with all hypotheses, they are in need of actual study before anything meaningful can be drawn from them. According to the author himself, this link between sucralose and IBD, this pattern that he has found, it may turn out to be pure coincidence. Or it could just be that he's wrong, that he's wrong about this connection, as he clearly was in this instance, uh, where he asserts that the rise in IBD in Korea is linked to sucralose use. As one of the authors of the original study detailing this rise in IBD explains, the timelines just don't match up. The rise in IBD in Korea began in the 80s, and yet sucralose wasn't approved until 2000. Seems like Chin may be seeing patterns where none exist. This is why public policy is not based on hypothetical reports like this, on correlations that could just turn out to be mere coincidences. If it were, then we would all be eschewing organic food to <laughs> prevent autism and giving up ice cream to avoid drowning. Splenda and the microbiome. In Dr. Greger's video, he says, There had been studies done on artificial sweeteners in the gut bacteria of rats going back years, but there had never been any human studies until now. He then mentions this study, which actually involves multiple components. I'll let Dr. Aaron Carroll from Healthcare Triage explain. And just to be clear, the human portion of this study only looked at saccharin. To date, no human studies have been conducted looking at sucralose and microbial alterations. And here's an interesting comment from the study's lead author. Further experiments with a large number of participants and over a longer duration are required before any recommendations regarding human consumption of artificial sweeteners can be made. And from their 2015 follow-up specific to sucralose, it remains to be determined whether sucralose also directly affects the microbiome. So we have one animal study that, according to the researchers themselves, is not enough to show that sucralose affects the microbiome. And yet the title of Dr. Greger's video, again, is Effect of Sucralose, 
on the microbiome. Why not effect of saccharin on the microbiome? This has a little bit more validity given that the, uh, again, the human portion of the study had to do with saccharin, not sucralose. In fact, many of the references that Gregor includes in his sources cited list, um, they are not specific to sucralose or they mention sucralose only in regard to animal studies, maybe a few couple human studies here or there, uh, or they have nothing at all to do with sucralose, like this one. So what's with the title? Could it be that Splenda is popular and saccharin is not? <laughs> so people are probably more likely to watch a video with Splenda in the title than with saccharin or even aspartame in the title. Uh, is it any surprise that this is by far his most popular video of late? Isn't clickbait lovely? Finally, I want to talk about the microbiome in general. Gregor clearly implies that microbial alterations, this is a bad thing and can actually lead to metabolic derangements like obesity. But as Dr. Carroll talked about in the clip that I showed, uh, we simply don't know what alterations in the gut microbiome, we don't really know what this means in terms of health outcome. In actuality, very little is known about the microbiome. The gut microbiome is like a fingerprint. It's different for all of us, and despite changes due to artificial sweetener consumption, there's no clear pattern in any of the artificial sweetener groups that would allow us to predict negative or positive effects based on what we know now. There is no, and I repeat, no convincing experimental evidence in humans that would remotely confirm that any potential changes of the gut microbiome that occur in response to the consumption of artificial sweeteners would entail ill health effects. Splenda and insulin resistance. So just like with the microbiome, Dr. Greger gives us one study with regard to insulin resistance, in this case one study uh, linking sucralose to insulin resistance. This is intended uh, to explain why some cohort studies have found a uh, correlation between artificial sweetener consumption and type 2 diabetes. Except, according to the researchers themselves, the clinical relevance of this observation is not clear, as it is not known whether insulin resistance induced by sucralose increases the risk of developing metabolic diseases. In fact, according to the lead author Yanina Penino, that's a hard thing to say, the elevated insulin response could be a good thing, because it shows the person is able to make enough insulin to deal with spiking glucose levels. But it also might be bad, because when people routinely secrete more insulin, they can become resistant to its effects, a path that leads to type 2 diabetes. To say that sucralose causes diabetes is stretching our study results too much. It's not exactly what we measured. More importantly, what does the rest of the research say? Dr. Greger gives us this one study as if it is the only study that's ever been done looking at sucralose and, you know, glucose levels, insulin levels, etc. Not at all. Here's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study on 128 people with type 2 diabetes. For three months, they received either capsules of cellulose, as placebo, or capsules of sucralose containing well above the maximum daily amount determined by the FDA. The results? Sucralose had no effect on glucose homeostasis in individuals with type 2 diabetes. Additionally, this study showed that sucralose was as well tolerated by the study subjects as was the placebo. Here is another randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial on diabetics, this one examining a single high dose, one gram a lot, of sucralose on short-term blood glucose homeostasis. The present results support the conclusion that sucralose consumption does not adversely affect short-term blood glucose control in patients with diabetes. Here's another randomized controlled trial on 10 healthy males who on four separate occasions consumed water alone or water with either 52 milligrams of sucralose, 200 milligrams of acesulfame potassium, or 46 milligrams of sucralose plus 26 milligrams of ace sulfame potassium. Our findings are consistent with previous reports that sucralose or ace sulfame potassium alone has no effect on glucagon-like peptide 1 secretion, insulin, or blood glucose concentrations. Here is another study, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. This study found that while diet soda sweetened with sucralose and acesulfame potassium did not stimulate GLP-1 secretion on its own, diet soda followed by a glucose load did. However, the metabolic consequences of increased GLP-1 release after ingestion of both artificial sweeteners and glucose remain uncertain. In the present study, no significant differences were observed in either plasma glucose or insulin after diet soda versus carbonated water ingestion, despite the significant differences in GLP-1. In other words, the bulk of the research conducted on humans, not on rats or mice, show that sucralose, along with other artificial sweeteners, even in huge doses, do not affect glucose or insulin levels. So it's very unlikely that sucralose consumption would lead to 
insulin resistance, much less type 2 diabetes. But what do the studies looking at outcomes like diabetes and obesity, what do these studies find? Well, according to Dr. Greger, they find that consumption of artificial sweeteners, mostly in the form of diet soda, uh, they may lead to an increased risk of developing these disorders. And sure they do, if you only look at the studies that come to that conclusion. Splenda and obesity. From this 2014 meta-analysis looking at 15 randomized controlled trials and nine prospective cohorts, findings from observational studies show no association between low calorie sweetener intake and body weight or fat mass, and a small positive association with BMI. However, data from randomized controlled trials which provide the highest quality of evidence for examining the potentially casual effects of LCS intake indicate that substituting LCS options for their regular calorie versions results in a modest weight loss and may be a useful dietary tool to improve compliance with weight loss or weight maintenance plans. An even more recent review, and an even more comprehensive one, comes to virtually the same conclusion. We found a considerable weight of evidence in favor of consumption of low energy sweeteners in place of sugar as helpful in reducing relative energy intake and body weight, with no evidence from the many acute and sustained intervention studies in humans that low energy sweeteners increase energy intake. So when looking at all of the evidence, uh, including both human and animal studies, uh, sucralose and other artificial sweeteners, they do not lead to weight gain and certainly not to obesity. In fact, the best evidence finds that they actually lead to a reduction in both caloric intake and, no surprise, body weight. Splenda and diabetes. For prospective cohort studies looking at artificial sweetener consumption, specifically diet soda consumption, uh, and diabetes have been conducted, and the results are split right down the middle, with two showing no association and two showing an adverse association. However, like with virtually all studies, uh, there are some potential problems. The studies all involved limited dietary assessment, food frequency questionnaires or diet histories, collected primarily at baseline only, and long follow-up periods during which dietary habits may have changed but gone undetected. Reverse causation is another issue with these studies. It's probable that the disease, that the diabetes, caused the Splenda, so to speak. It's very similar to the link between mental illness and vegetarianism, which I've talked about on this channel before. The media loves to spin it as giving up meat makes you go crazy, <laughs> gives you depression and anxiety. Yet what the research shows is that the illness actually came before giving up meat. In this case, it's likely that those who were at a higher risk for diabetes, possibly because they were overweight, uh, were just more likely to consume diet sodas than sugar-sweetened sodas, probably as a way to lose weight. In fact, this is what two of the cohorts found. This one from 2011 found that artificially sweetened soda was significantly associated with type 2 diabetes in over 40,000 males, but this association was largely explained by health status, pre-enrollment weight change, dieting, and body mass index. This one from 2004 came to essentially the same conclusion, an increased diabetes risk that became non-significant after controlling for BMI. Compensation is yet another potential issue. The human body is a complex system, as is human psychology, so we have to consider the law of unintended consequences. It is possible, for example, that when people drink a diet beverage, they feel they have earned the right to consume more calories elsewhere. This phenomenon is called compensation, and there is evidence for this effect. Finally, all of these studies looked at diet soda specifically, which is obviously something that contains more than artificial sweeteners. Could it be that something else in these drinks is contributing to the increased risk for diabetes that was found in two of the four cohorts? And as you can see here, the vast majority of diet soft drinks contain aspartame, not sucralose. And the ones that do contain sucralose, they contain other artificial sweeteners, either aspartame or asulfame potassium or both. Just saying. So what to make of these studies? What to make of this? Uh, Apparently not much, considering that the scientific consensus on sucralose and other artificial sweeteners is that they are safe, even for diabetics. This is actually a great example of why randomized controlled trials are the gold standard, why they are more valuable than cohort studies. Uh, there are just so many potentially confounding variables with epidemiological studies like these that it's difficult to tease out a conclusion um, that is applicable in terms of making or amending public health policy. 
Luckily, we have RCTs examining sucralose and other artificial sweeteners and blood sugar regulation. As I've already shown, the majority of these have found that sucralose does not affect glucose or insulin levels, suggesting that sucralose does not increase the risk for type 2 diabetes. Ignoring outcomes. The media, self-help books, and nutrition and alternative gurus have been handing out conflicting recommendations to the public, largely based on extrapolation from possible mechanisms, animal studies, and observational studies. This is exactly what Dr. Greger is doing, extrapolating from possible mechanisms, alterations in gut microbiome that could possibly lead to obesity and other metabolic disorders, uh, exhibited in animal research. Worse, he is doing so with no acknowledgement of the numerous studies that actually look at these outcomes, which, as I've already shown, they don't support his conclusion. Worst of all, he is sharing this extrapolation, this opinion, with thousands of people, many of whom simply don't have the ability to verify this information for themselves. If Dr. Greger says it, it must be true. In retrospect, and not only with the question of low energy sweeteners, but with many health questions, these types of studies should be considered with a heavy dose of skepticism. There is a reason why skeptics and proponents of science-based medicine don't find such studies definitive, because history has shown they are often misleading. Greger's focus on the microbiome, on animal studies, on observational studies is likely an example of this. Again, high quality studies, including RCTs, uh, they do not support the notion, the claim, that Splenda and other artificial sweeteners make people fat, nor do they support the claim that they lead to insulin resistance. The perfect versus the good. Importantly, none of the studies concluded that diet soda consumption should be replaced with regular soda consumption. Regular soda intake has been much more consistently associated with type 2 diabetes. To be clear, Dr. Greger does not say in this video, don't consume artificial sweeteners, and he certainly doesn't say, replace them with sugar. What he does say in his conclusion, he concludes with a uh, review from 2013, for optimal health, it is recommended that only minimal amounts of both sugar and non-nutritive sweeteners be consumed. And is anyone saying otherwise? I've never heard of anyone recommending that we consume tons of Splenda a day or tons of diet soda a day. And what exactly does minimal mean? Like less than the acceptable daily intake? Considering that for sucralose, that comes to five milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day, this is equivalent to 23 packets a day for someone like me, weighing 132 pounds, which is equivalent to 60 ounces of Pepsi One, or five 12 ounce cans per day. Yeah, most people are not consuming anywhere near that amount. Little side note here, but the section on sucralose from this review that Gregor quotes is particularly interesting. To summarize, Sucralose is non-carcinogenic, non-genotoxic, and non-karyogenic, which means that it does not promote tooth decay. It also does not change the rate of glucose absorption from the small intestine, does not increase glycemic response or levels of GLP-1, does not stimulate insulin release or slow gastric emptying, nor does it raise up blood sugar levels or increase insulin resistance. The only potential adverse health effects that are mentioned are one, a few cases of migraines, we'll get to that in a minute, and two, the IBD hypothesis that I already mentioned. That's it. So now back to Dr. Greger's video, and like many of his videos, he ultimately leaves it up to you. He leaves it up to uh, the viewer to decide what to do with the information that he presents. The problem with this, as I alluded to in the last section, is that the average person is just not capable of making that decision. The average person does not understand that one study on rats is not enough to disregard all of the evidence to the contrary. The average person does not understand the difference between in vitro and in vivo, epidemiology and etiology, or the difference in weight between a case report and a randomized controlled trial. And the average person does not understand that just because something is artificial doesn't automatically mean it's worse than something that's natural. This is a problem, a problem that is illustrated just so beautifully by Ryan in his video. Hmm, interesting. A product that's supposed to help fight diabetes and obesity actually brings it on by changing your intestinal gut flora. According to Ryan, these studies and the hypothetical report that Gregor lays out in his video, they are irrefutable proof that Splenda is harmful. And if you look at the comments on Ryan's video, as well as the comments on Greer's video, many people agree. This is kind of scary stuff. Not because an audience who wasn't consuming Splenda still isn't consuming Splenda. 
but because of what they may do with that information. Maybe they will tell others, maybe they will share it on Facebook, on Twitter, whatever. Maybe they will tell their parents and their grandparents, people who use artificial sweeteners as a way to consume less sugar, to manage their weight, maybe to manage their diabetes. Maybe these people will give up Splenda in favor of just plain water or fruit. But is that a reasonable assumption? I see a lot of children in clinic who drink gallons of juice, soda, or milk, and who have a weight problem. The first thing I try to do is eliminate the empty calories of sugar-sweetened beverages. Getting them to do water is often very hard. I know, some of the commenters did it without any difficulty at all, but I don't think that's the experience of lots of people. If I can get a child to switch to sugar-free lemonade, at least as a start, I'm eliminating hundreds of calories a day of added sugars. It's a comparative thing. I'm not saying artificial sweeteners are safer than nothing. I'm saying that if I had to choose between the diet drink and the one with added sugars, I'd go with the diet drink. That was from Dr. Carroll again from Healthcare Triage. And as he says in his video on artificial sweeteners, let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Yes, if we are talking about drinking diet soda or drinking, you know, water or, or eating fruit or something, obviously water or fruit is better. Water is actually completely calorie free, very good for you, obviously. And uh, fruit is very low in calories with essential nutrients that are clearly lacking in artificial sweeteners and diet sodas and in the American diet in general. But this does not mean that people are always going to choose water or fruit. If it's between artificial sweeteners or sugar, artificial sweeteners are by far the best option. If a diabetes educator had previously been successful at helping a diabetic patient manage their glucose control by substituting diet soda for regular soda, it could be detrimental if this position was abandoned and the patient was to conclude from this review that there was no important difference between diet soda and regular soda and switch back to regular soda. The experts are lying, or the experts are stupid. Or maybe not. So I've gone through a lot of research in this video focusing on reviews and meta-analyses and RCTs, but I really didn't need to. As I said in my original Spl Splenda video, the scientific consensus is that Splenda and other artificial sweeteners are safe. Uh, numerous regulatory agencies and organizations from around the world have concluded this, from the FDA to the European Food Safety Authority. Further, the fear-mongering is dependent upon accepting a conspiracy-oriented view of reality. In order for the negative claims about sucralose to be true, then regulatory agencies from around the world are either complicit or hopelessly incompetent. In addition, professional organizations must also be on the take or ignorant of their own supposed area of expertise. I am not, however, as will likely be the accusation, preaching mindless acceptance of authority. I simply think expert systematic reviews are more reliable than distorted or cherry-picked evidence with an agenda. As one of my favorite YouTubers, Potholer54, says, know your limitations and recognize that when you come across information that goes against the scientific consensus, no matter what the topic, it means one of three things. Either scientists are all incompetent, or they're all in on a conspiracy, or they know something I don't, and I need to find out what that is. Hint. Try option three first. Look, I really don't care if you consume Splenda or not. What I care about is the spread of misinformation and the effect that this misinformation can have on people who easily succumb to appeals to nature, which unfortunately is most people. I recently gave a lecture at Google. Google is a progressive company that tries to help their employees stay healthy. They provide many snack stations and helpfully divide snacks into red, yellow, and green shelves. Employees can freely choose whatever snacks they want, but they are gently encouraged to choose from the more healthful green shelf and avoid the unhealthy red shelf. I noticed that beverages sweetened with sugarcane were placed on the green shelf, while those sweetened with artificial sweeteners like aspartame or Splenda were slumming on the red shelf. It was ironic to see such a high-tech company falling for the appeal to nature fallacy. I also care about the effect that this may have on veganism, particularly the effect that it may have on how non-vegans view veganism. I don't think that aligning ourselves with pseudoscience like vaccines cause autism or GMOs cause cancer or Splenda causes obesity and diabetes is doing the animals any favors. Oh, and no, that one study did not find that Splenda causes cancer. This has nothing to do with Gregor's video. He does not talk about it, that in his video, but I'm sure someone will bring it up in the comments, so I figured I would briefly mention it. This study absolutely does not support the conclusion that a normal exposure to Splenda is dangerous. In fact, the category representing the maximum recommended dose had no significant effects. 
So if anything, this study supports the conclusion that our current exposure rates are safe. Remember, everything is dangerous at a high enough dose, so it's hardly surprising that learning that taking more than the recommended maximum dose is dangerous, and it does not suggest that the recommended dose is dangerous. So to wrap this part of the video up, I still have a little bit more after this, but uh, you know, if you choose to avoid sucralose because you don't like the taste, or because you like your coffee black, or because fruit for dessert just works perfectly fine for you, cool. But if you choose to avoid it because you find Gregor's myopic view of the evidence compelling, well, then you should also choose to avoid stevia, since stevia has been linked to alterations in the gut microbiome, specifically inhibition of good bacteria, and it has also been linked to weight gain. The problem with nutritionfacts.org. To be clear, I am not at all against talking about, you know, the evidence showing a potential link between Splenda and other artificial sweeteners and the microbiome, for instance. What I am against is a video that clearly prioritizes clicks over content. A more balanced view is certainly in order here, something that mentions the potential link between artificial sweeteners and the microbiome, uh, but also mentions the drawbacks of such studies, including that we don't really know what any of that means, and also includes a clear description of the actual studies looking at actual outcomes like obesity and type 2 diabetes. But of course, all of that is much less interesting to a subscriber base who just wants to hear that anything unnatural, from Splenda to chemotherapy, is evil. And this brings me to a brief discussion of Gregor and his website, his nonprofit, nutritionfacts.org. Um, as I mentioned in a recent comment, I have some serious issues with his work, things that have just been uh, building up over time and, and getting worse. And it's to the point now where I no longer feel comfortable positively referencing his work on this channel. Many of his older videos were good, exploring you know, links between animal protein and health, and antioxidant content of fruits and vegetables, and uh, health effects of you know healthy plant fats in the diet, uh, but it seems, I think recently, maybe <laughs> that he has just run out of steam a little bit. He's run out of topics to cover, and instead of waiting until something comes up, um, he's succumb to the pressure of his audience to tell them what they want to hear. Here are a couple of examples. The first one, a much older video from 2009, from his video uh, A Harmless Artificial Sweetener, in which he lists sucralose as harmful only because of a few case reports uh, that found a link to migraines. That's like saying peanuts are harmful because some people are allergic. In a recent video on vitamin C uh, as a treatment for cancer, he pulls out the alternative guru quack tagline, chemotherapy has only a 2% success rate. Uh, this is misleading and incredibly alarming considering his audience, people who are already anti-chemo and anti-medicine in general. just. Oh god, check out the comments on that video. You can learn more about the 2% gambit and the poorly conducted study that it's based on at the link in the description. Worst of all is Gregor's ability to make videos that seem really science-y because of all of the references that he includes. While in reality, avoiding evidence to the contrary, meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and even the scientific consensus. His Splenda microbiome video is a perfect example of this. You know, it appears that he isn't cherry-picking, given all of the references in his sources cited list, but the problem is that these references, they aren't all examining the same things. Um, you know, the microbiome, for instance, again, he includes one study looking at sucralose in the microbiome. What about insulin resistance? Again, one study. What about the IBD link? A single hypothesis by a single author. So in the end, what looks like an honest rendering of the available research is just cherry-picking. But maybe this isn't Gregor. Maybe he isn't even reading the papers anymore. Maybe it's just a biased research assistant. Whatever the case, I hope that Gregor comes to his senses and realizes what's happening and stops pandering to his audience with fucking clickbait. That's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it took a while to get out, but I hope it was worth the wait. <laughs> and uh, yeah, of course, let me know what you think. And if you have any questions, whatever, leave them down in the comments below. And if you want to subscribe, subscribe, and if you want to support me, you can do so at patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan, or right here on YouTube on the right-hand side of my channel page. Thank you so much, guys, and I will have a new video soon, probably. 
It won't be as long. It won't be as long of a wait as last time. I don't think. Very likely won't be. Stop it! Ah.